The train was on its way to Chicago, and Captain Coulter Stevens, an accomplished army pilot, found himself suddenly awake on board. He was disoriented and couldn't understand where he was. As he tried to make sense of his surroundings, a woman seated across from him started talking to him. She called him Sean, but that wasn't his name. Coulter was too busy observing every movement on the train, he didn't even realize the conductor was asking for his ticket. Christina, the woman who was speaking to him, offered to help find his ticket, but Coulter was too jittery to calm down. Christina noticed his strange behavior and asked why he was acting so odd, but Coulter didn't know the answer. He told her that he didn't even know who she was. Confused and disorientated, Captain Coulter Stevens got up from his seat and went outside for a moment to try and figure out where he was. But after a brief attempt, he returned to his seat next to Christina, still unsure of his surroundings. As he settled back into his seat, he caught a glimpse of his reflection in the train window and was shocked to see a completely different face staring back at him. He quickly made his way to the bathroom and upon looking into the mirror, saw a stranger's face. As he opened his wallet, he found a picture of the same person. Christina was waiting for him outside the bathroom and he informed her that he didn't know who Sean or she was. Suddenly, the train exploded and Coulter awoke in a different place. He heard a female voice telling him that he was with beleaguered Tassel and asking if he was functional. Still, in a state of confusion, he couldn't answer any of the questions the voice was asking. The voice only wanted to know what had happened on the train and the source of the explosion. Confused and trying to piece together what was happening, Coulter asked the female voice who she was. The voice then appeared on a monitor in front of him and told Coulter that he already knew the answer. She then explained that they would help rebuild his memory pattern and began a mnemonic procedure, reading him a passage while accompanying visuals appeared on the screen. However, Coulter was too distracted to pay attention and was attempting to free himself from the seat. Suddenly, he remembered parts of the exercise and repeated back what he had heard. The voice asked for her name and Coulter called her Goodwin. Dr. Rutledge briefly appeared on the monitor, checking something, before Coulter asked to speak to his father. But before he could get any further, Goodwin interrupted him and continued to ask about the bomb on the train. She told him that Christina calling him by another name was just a coincidence. When Coulter revealed that he didn't know who bombed the train, Goodwin told him that he would be sent back inside for eight minutes again. Coulter believed that he was in a simulation, but Goodwin refused to give him any information about his status. Instead, she insisted that he focus on finding out more information about the train. Find the bomb, and you find the bomber she told him. Back on the train, Christina was telling Coulter about her plans to take the LSAT after quitting her job. Coulter heard the sound of a soda can opening and saw a woman spill coffee on his shoe. He commented that the train was the same, but different in some way, which Christina took as a profound statement. Coulter activated a timer on his watch and was still convinced that everything was a simulation. He searched the train for the potential bomber and approached a man, asking how long the delay would be. The man made a joke, and Christina told Coulter that he was a comedian. Coulter continued to look around the train, searching for anything out of the ordinary. He saw a student return a wallet to its rightful owner, and then remembered the explosion coming from behind him. He went into the bathroom, and noticed that the vent had been tampered with. Upon opening it, he finally found the bomb. Thinking that Goodwin could hear him, Coulter began talking to her, seeking instructions on what to do with the bomb. He left the bomb as he found it and came up with a new plan to find the bomber. He went back into the train cart and lied to the passengers, telling them that he was transit security and that there had been a security breach, instructing them to turn off all their electronic devices. However, no one believed him, and when he saw a man still using his laptop, he closed it for him and broke his jaw. As the man lay injured, Christina rushed over to help him, but Coulter told her not to worry as neither of them were real. The train exploded, and Coulter found himself back with Goodwin. She told him to stabilize and lower his pulse, and then asked if he had found the bomb. Coulter confirmed that he had, but asked to speak to Dr. Rutledge as he realized that he was her commanding officer. Coulter was still confused, thinking that he was in Afghanistan just two days prior. However, Goodwin corrected him, saying that it had been two months. Despite his confusion, he answered her questions about the train. Goodwin then told him that he was not in a simulation but that real lives were at stake. Desiring to know more, Coulter asked for more information before he could continue with the mission. Goodwin asked Dr. Rutledge if she could reveal anything, and upon receiving his confirmation, 
She told Coulter that the train he was on had already exploded that morning, and that similar attacks were underway. She explained that Sean Fentress was on that train, and that Coulter was now Sean. Although he didn't fully understand yet, Goodwin continued to push for information. Coulter told Goodwin where he found the bomb, and what type of detonator it was operated with. Goodwin explained to Coulter that the detonation was planned to occur at the same time as a passing freight train, causing both vehicles to be engulfed in the explosion. She deduced that the bomber must have been close enough to see when that would happen and timed the detonation accordingly. Goodwin instructed Coulter to concentrate on the passengers on his train and only perform the tasks she had given him. They then sent him back to the train. Coulter woke up in the middle of the same conversation he had previously been in. He saw the woman spill coffee on Christina's shoes and was struck by Christina's kind response. Believing that she was real, Coulter asked the conductor about the behavior of the passengers on the train. But the conductor pointed out that Coulter was the one acting strange. Coulter then asked Christina if anyone looked suspicious to her and told her to sit next to him, saying to think of it as a game. Christina joked about the people in the car, not taking Coulter's request seriously. She commented that he knew the people better than she did because he talked to them all the time. Suddenly, Coulter noticed a man coming out of the bathroom, and Christina commented that they were going into racial profiling. Christina told Coulter that the man he saw coming out of the bathroom was the only other person she had seen go in, making Coulter pause for a moment. He searched through Sean's belongings, but only found her name in his notebook. Determined to find the man, Coulter made Christina come with him. He told her to wait outside the station as he followed the man into the washroom. He could hear the man getting sick in a stall and inspected him, making the man extremely uncomfortable. The man left with Coulter following him. Coulter approached the man as he sat on a bench and asked to borrow his phone. The man asked to be left alone, but Coulter persisted and eventually attacked him, trying to get his phone. The bomb then exploded, making Coulter suspect that the man might be the bomber. Not completely convinced, Coulter chased after the man again, but the man pushed him onto the train tracks. Coulter didn't get up in time and was hit by an oncoming bus. He awoke in the other place, but neither he nor beleaguered Castle could hear each other. The place was freezing cold and began to shut down. The man working with Goodwin told her that Coulter was in trouble, and they both went to see Dr. Rutledge. Rutledge told them that no one had ever been in Coulter's situation before, and that they should send signals to him, and see if he responded to any of them. While in the place where he was, Coulter found a toolkit and managed to restart the power. He began hearing distorted voices, and heard Goodwin reading the passage to him. Dr. Rutledge then spoke to him, confirming that he was in charge of the device Coulter was inside of. As Coulter told them about saving a passenger on the train, Goodwin returned and continued the conversation. She told him that saving the people on the train was outside of his mission. Coulter argued that he had saved someone, but Rutledge explained that the person only survived in the source code. When asked by Coulter what source code was, Rutledge tried to simplify it for him. He explained that source code was not a time travel machine, but more like a time reassignment. Coulter could only go back there and report what he had seen through the eyes of Sean Fentress, who was his link in a parallel reality. Coulter insisted that he had saved someone, so Goodwin asked for the person's name and looked for her online. She told Coulter that Christina had died that morning on the train. Despite his confusion, they needed to send him back again, as there was a second suspected attack in the center of Chicago. The attackers were believed to have a dirty bomb, and the city was being evacuated. Suddenly, as the army believes that Coulter's success in finding the bomber of the train could prevent another attack, Goodwin prepares him for his mission by informing him of a handgun he can locate on the train and granting him permission to use any necessary force. Upon waking up on the train, Coulter is disheartened to find Christina there. Despite his growing feelings for her, Coulter sets out to complete his mission and finds the gun exactly where Goodwin told him it would be. However, when the conductor catches him accessing the safe with the gun, Coulter points the weapon at him, only to be electrocuted by the second conductor. Waking up on the train again, Coulter struggles to explain his actions to Christina and running out of time. He asks her what she would do with only one minute left. Coulter says he would call his father and apologize. As the bomb explodes, Christina says it will be okay. Before returning to the other place, Coulter experiences strange visions involving Christina and tells Goodwin the gun wasn't the smartest idea and wants to talk to his dad. Goodwin says she will try but doesn't promise. 
Coulter asks how he is doing because he is confused. Goodwood shows where he is kept and says she cannot go to the other side because it's too difficult. Confused about the ongoing process, Coulter asks Goodwin about his progress. She reveals his physical location and explains that she has never been on the other side of the source code, as only a select few are suitable candidates, insisting they not waste more time. Goodwin reassures Coulter of his progress and sends him back to investigate passengers' belongings. Returning to the train, Coulter proceeds more quickly. After sketching the military patch Goodwin had shown him, he encounters Christina. He requests her assistance in locating a missing friend from Afghanistan and provides his real name for her search. Soon he grows suspicious of a man talking on the phone. Approaching the man, Coulter rummages through his bag. He then notices a woman carrying a bag from an army medical center and engages her in conversation. He inquires about the letters on the patch, and she informs him that they represent the Air Force, with the N standing for Nellis. Borrowing her phone, Coulter calls Nellis Air Force Base asks for Rutledge, and informs the operator that Captain Coulter Stevens is on the line. Christina locates him, and reveals that the friend he asked her to search for had been killed in action two months prior. Abruptly, Coulter recalls memories from Afghanistan, and hears Goodwin guiding him through mnemonic exercises. Upon awakening elsewhere, he immediately questions Goodwin about his own mortality. He mentions finding an online article, stating his death and his father receiving a medal on his behalf. Goodwin urges him to concentrate on the train mission, deeming other matters insignificant. Persistent in his quest for answers, Coulter learns partial truth from Goodwin. She reveals that a portion of his brain remains active while his body is a mere manifestation. He wonders if he is imagining being in the capsule as it starts to disintegrate. Goodwin confirms that the capsule, too, is a manifestation and withholds information on the location of his actual body. Rutledge interjects, Emphasizing the need to return Coulter to the train to avert another attack, Coulter expresses his disagreement with how the source code operates and informs Rutledge of his call from the train that morning. Rutledge denies receiving the call and suggests that if he had, it would have been in an alternate reality, with the Rutledge on the receiving end being an entirely different person. To persuade Coulter, Rutledge explains that the project was authorized by a military court and that many soldiers would appreciate the opportunity to continue serving their country rather than facing death. Coulter counters that for many soldiers, dying once is service enough. Rutledge vows to let Coulter die if he completes the mission. Before sending him back to the train, Rutledge reminds Coulter that two million Americans rely on the success of their mission, and if he doesn't value his own life, he should value theirs. Rutledge then began to repeatedly send Coulter back on the train without any rest period, insisting that they would keep doing it until the bomber was found. Despite Coulter's protests that he couldn't do it, Rutledge manipulated him by playing a recording of his father's interview after his death, causing Coulter to agree to be sent back in. Back on the train, Coulter immediately went for the bomb and took the detonator phone out. He called the only phone number in its call log, and as he moved through the train, a man answered. Coulter told the man to turn around, but as the man in front of him heard him and turned, Coulter sat next to him and threatened him with a gun, saying that he couldn't kill anyone. As the man swore that he was talking to his wife, Coulter instructed him to call the phone again. Suddenly, another phone rang and Coulter apologized to him. He heard the phone outside and chased after the man. He saw the man put his wallet back on the train and finally learned his name, Derek Frost. The doors of the train closed, but Coulter opened them with the emergency handle and jumped off to pursue Derek. When he caught up with him, he saw Derek enter a white van. Coulter approached Derek and showed him the phone, but Derek pretended not to recognize it. Despite this, Coulter knew it was Derek and revealed to him the second bomb hidden inside the van. As Coulter inspected the bomb and questioned Derek about his next target, Catherine appeared. Derek shot them both, but Coulter was still alive. Derek then gave Coulter a long speech about why he was doing what he was doing explaining that the world was a hell that needed to be rebuilt, even if it meant being destroyed. Derek got into the van and drove away, leaving Coulter behind. The bomb on the train exploded, but when Coulter transitioned back to the capsule, he remembered more clearly what had happened. He immediately told Goodwin and Rutledge about the bomber and the van he had entered. He confirmed that the second bomb was radioactive. Goodwin and Rutledge congratulated him and declared his mission to be over. But before they left him, 
Coulter asked to be sent back to try to save the people before he died. As the army apprehended Derek Frost, before he could detonate the second bomb, Rutledge received validation for his project from his superiors and Goodwin returned to speak with Coulter. The conversation shifted to the possibilities of parallel realities and the differing versions of people that might exist there. Goodwin explained that Coulter had only seen shadows or after images of the people who die on the train and informed him that he couldn't alter the past. Despite this, Coulter insisted that there was a fail-safe on the explosive that he hadn't seen before and that Goodwin was incorrect. He implored her to send him back without approval and to switch him off afterwards. Despite having some trouble deciding, Goodwin ultimately agreed, telling Coulter that she would terminate his life support at the end of his source code. Coulter stated that he would save Christina, to which Goodwin replied that it was an honor and wished him good luck. Back on the train for the last time, Coulter asked Christina out for coffee, which she eagerly accepted. He asked for a few minutes to save the world, and immediately went to the bomb, removing both the first and second detonators. He then passed by Derek and stole the conductor's handcuffs. With the source code still active, Rutledge received more positive reviews from his superiors while Goodwin entered his office. He instructed her to wipe Coulter's memory and prepare him for a new source code, with no intention to let him die, to Goodwin's disapproval. Back at the train, Coulter sprang into action. He swiftly stopped Direct from escaping and secured him to a bar with handcuffs. He brandished the phone and called the police, informing them of Direct's plan and the location of the radioactive bomb. Coulter took possession of the phone and left Derek behind. He sent an email to Goodwin from the phone and then called his father. Coulter explained to his father that he was a friend and that he wanted to apologize before he died. Meanwhile, Goodwin arrived at the chamber where Coulter's body was being kept and opened the door, revealing the state of his condition. Coulter's father expressed his regret for not telling him that he loved him, but Coulter assured him that he already knew. Coulter returned to Christina. Rutledge received a call that Goodwin was with Coulter and immediately requested the presence of military police. He attempted to unlock the door and reach Coulter. Goodwin patiently waited for Coulter's eight minutes to elapse. On the train, Coulter posed a question to Christina about what she would do if she only had a minute left to live. She replied that she would make every second count. Coulter leaned in and kissed her. Goodwin switched off Coulter's life support and the military police rushed inside only to find Coulter's lifeless body. Back at the train, the expected explosion never occurred. Coulter reassured Christina that everything was going to be okay. They took a leisurely walk to the Chicago Bean, and Coulter realized that the visions he had experienced during his transitions were of that very moment. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications to stay on top of all the latest recaps and never miss a beat. Thank you for watching.